we've allowed the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Vrijheid is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijp je wat je mist. Reverse the question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political news is worldwide. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Freedom Lecture. This is actually our 20th Freedom Lecture. Uh, my name is Luzuis van der Laan. It is my distinguished honor to be able to guide you through this evening, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the program. But first, if this is your first Freedom Lecture, welcome. This is um, the 20th, and it was founded about five years ago when we were celebrating 400 years of the Dutch canals. But actually, we, of course, celebrate freedom and, sadly, we have to study its counterpart, uh, oppression. And we're extremely honored that today, as a special guest, we have Annabel Hernandez. We're really glad you made it, um, despite the weather and everything else. So, uh, so very warm welcome to you here. So um, uh, first, before I move on to the program, this evening would not be possible without the generous support of the Weefonds and the Stichting Democratie and Media. And I have to say on a personal note, I think it's wonderful that the Bali takes time, money, energy to uh, invite people like Annabel Hernandez here and to focus the intention of the world on what's happening in other parts of the world so that we don't only enjoy our own freedom or take it for granted, but that we realize that this is something where we need to work together on a global scale. So Annabel Hernandez, if you don't know her yet, um, uh, has written a book called Narco Land, The Mexican Drug Lords and Their Godfathers which when it was published was an immediate hit in Mexico, but at the same time uh, means that uh, her personal safety can no longer be assured and she still has protection to this day. Uh, she had to leave Mexico for a while, uh, but is back there now. We'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about the background of that. Her family is in danger uh, because what she did was to link uh, the so-called war on drugs um, the, uh, the drug trade in Mexico to the government um, and many of the officials and personalities involved are still simply in their job today. And that's one of the topics we're going to be exploring tonight. She will be introduced by uh, Teun Voete, so I won't be doing that. After um, Teun's introduction and um, Annabel's um, speech, we will have a panel and we will be joined by Jos Bartman and Marijn de Waal. So we have an academic and a journalistic uh, perspective. Um, and then, of course, uh, both after Annabel's lecture and during a Q&A, we would love to hear from you, the audience, questions, not speeches. Um, I'd love to hear what, you, uh, what your questions are to the panel and, uh, and especially to Annabel Hernandez. So in order to introduce um, uh, Annabel, um, I'm very, very happy to hand over the floor to Teun Voete, who is a cultural anthropologist by training, and he is a photographer specializing in war. And uh, I think you've tried some nice, peaceful photos, but they didn't work out as well as the other ones. So I think this is, this is your true calling, is to put the camera uh, and the spotlight on, uh, on horrible atrocities. He's done books on the underground homeless in New York, uh, and the war in Sierra Leone, and most recently on the drug violence in Mexico. And I could think of no better person to introduce Annabel tonight than Teun Voet. A warm welcome, please. Well, thanks, Luis, for this very nice intro. Um, it's a huge honor for me to be uh, invited uh, to talk a little bit about Mexico and introduce uh, Annabel, Annabel uh, Hernandez. Um, Annabel is at this moment uh, number one investigative journalist numero uno. And uh, I hope she will stay with us a long time. Uh, it, it's very telling. We will be talking uh, tonight about um, journalism. 
repression risks. It's very telling that uh, Jos, who is later in the in the panel, and me, we we are Dutch people, but we both lost very good uh, journalist friends. Um, Ruben Espinosa was a good friend of Jos, and Javier Valdez. Kulia Khan was a good friend of mine. He was killed this year by 13 bullets. And Annabel lost, of course, a lot of friends as well. Um, Mexico is a very serious country. It's a very strange country. Um, I've been working as a war photographer for 30 years, but uh, I started to focus on uh, Mexico uh, since 2009 in Ciudad Juarez. And it was so interesting that uh, I first made a photo book, and currently I'm actually doing a PhD on, on the drug violence because it's 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 a very to say it a little bit more, but a fascinating conflict. It's, it's on the one hand, it's Mexico is is not some kind of third world crazy country, um, but it's a very modern, civilized country, very big uh, GDP, uh, gross domestic product. I'm not so good in economics. Uh, of course, culturally very well advanced, modern skyscrapers. It's not some um, foreign red hole with um, a crazy war going on with lunatic warlords, but. What's so typical about um, Mexico, to, to uh, name a few numbers, uh, there have been the last 10 years, uh, 10, 12 years, nobody knows the exact numbers, uh, uh, between 150,000 or 200,000 um, uh, violent deaths. And uh, even more shocking is that, that there is an impunity of maybe 98%. So basically, um, it, it's an estimate that these wars, uh, these uh, deaths are drug related, but, but uh, most people think so, but, but nobody knows exactly because actually 98% of murders is never solved. Um, since 2000, 100 journalists have been killed and uh, most of these murders have never been, been solved uh, and will never be solved. Uh, people in Mexico are very pessimistic about this 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 uh, this situation. Uh, the, the strange thing about Mexico, um, which is very hard for people in Western Europe to understand, uh, we are used to democratic states uh, where the state has on the monopoly on violence, and of course we have crime, criminal organisations. But there is a little bit of a neat separation between the underground. Uh, economy and the authorities in Mexico, um, there used to be a cooperation. Uh, narco violence started 100 years ago with small uh, farmers growing uh, opium in, in uh, Sinaloa. And then the mayor and the police commissioner, they were still in charge. They, they took a little cut. It was a small time, small corruption. Uh, of course, this narco business became really huge uh, with um, Marijuana, uh, smoking, hippies in the US. Uh, Mexican people are very smart businessmen, as they smell the opportunity. Later on, uh, cocaine routes going through the Caribbean were blocked, and it all, uh, the Mexicans jumped on that opportunity and became from million to a multi billion industry. At one point, uh, government and criminals had an equal working relationship, uh, but it is right now the other way around that basically. Uh, the narco mafia is in charge in Mexico and is ordering the politicians. And yes, there must be a few very honest politicians and there must be some very evil warlords. But the rest of Mexico, you can see there's a kind of bell curve where everybody is one way or the other involved. No one's violence if he wants or if he does not want. Uh, the means of the narco mafia are corruption, uh, intimidation, uh, bribery, and it, it's very hard to stay clean. And um, there are extremely gross examples. One of the grossest examples: the, the 43 students that went missing uh, a few years ago, and where the the mayor of the town, his wife, and the police commissioner were directly involved and arrested. And there are thousands of other um, examples of blatant uh, corruption. Uh, and um, uh, that's why it's so important that there are media reporting on this situation and, and researchers. And um, basically, I've been working as a journalist and researcher in Mexico. Um, 
and actually there are three kinds of journalists in visiting Mexico, working in Mexico, while us, the foreign press, basically we, we fly in, we, uh, we spend a week, we spend two weeks, we are always a little bit scratching on the surface, especially photographers, and basically after one or two weeks we can just leave and, and um, go back alive. Um, if, if we got a threat, we know it's, it's time to leave. I actually myself never received any threats. Then you have a lot of local journalists who work very, very um, careful not to, not to hurt anybody's feelings, and I'm talking about feelings of the narco mafia, and they, they're pretty sensitive feelings. So there is a lot of self-censorship, and then there is a very small minority of, of this is the most uh, dangerous uh, aspect of journalism, is investigative journalism, and uh, this, these are the very few very brave people who, who expose the links between authorities and narco mafia, and these people run the biggest risks. And uh, just mentioned Ruben Espinosa in uh, Vera Cruz, Javier Valdez, he was an investigative journalist, Culiacan. And of course, uh, one of the most important numero uno investigative journalists is Annabel Hernandez. And uh, I think uh, I can only. Uh, 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 show my greatest respect for people like that. I mean, I, I, I as a war journalist, I, I run a lot of risks too, but I go in a war and I, when it's too crazy, I just go home. So uh, I, it, it's a great honor again, and uh, I hope people will learn a lot from Annabelle. Um, I show a few of my photos. Um, this is, uh, Sophie, was the photo before here or not? Oh, yeah, the, these are the, this is the, the, the young people. Uh, I was in Ciudad Juarez and uh, a lot of uh, the, this, this disposable class, excluded class, uh, uh, collateral damage of a neoliberal system. Uh, young kids going in gangs, killing each other, and these are their girlfriends. It, it's very, uh, for me as an anthropologist, uh, I think in statistics and facts, but it's also as a photographer, I, I like to, to think, focus on individuals, on emotions, and this is just taken after a, a murder scene. So the next one. Uh, when I was in Ciudad Juarez, uh, as a foreign journalist, I had the privilege of being invited by the local police and the local uh, military. This is Policia Militar. This is also very difficult for local journalists. If you are walking around with the Policia Militar, uh, you, people might think you partial and you might run in risk of one of the criminal organizations. But for me as a foreign journalist, it, it was, you have a little bit of um, neutral status. So the next one. This is in Sinaloa, uh, Culiacan. I was working with a lot of local journalists. As a foreign journalist, we, uh, our f best friends are the local journalists who work there every day, day in and day out, and uh, they are incredible, generous with showing me, and I'm pretty sure Jos and Marijn also, the, the ins and the outs of uh, the, the drug violence. Last one. This is a very way, in a way this is actually my saddest photo. These are young people in Ciudad Juarez protesting against the violence, but who is carrying out the violence? It is a conglomerate of criminal organizations intermingled with, with states and, and municipal organizations and authorities. And basically, uh, I love the optimism of this feeling, but it, it's the same as the uh, Dutch people protesting against the rain. And uh, it's, it's pretty, you should do it. It's annoying, but it's, it's there. And um, uh, I'm frankly not that, that, that optimistic uh, on Mexico. Uh, the corruption is so deeply ingrained. Um, if you want to solve the problem, the whole society needs a complete reset and make over. And, um, as long as there is money to be made in the drug business and as long as there are willing consumers, and this is a pretty um, nasty issue, but everybody in Holland and Belgium and, as we know, Antwerp or Rotterdam, are one of the biggest uh, importing harbors of cocaine, is uh, by using uh, these products uh, responsible and financing narco-terror. And um, I'm not saying... Uh, 
I'm not making a moral argument about drugs, but some drugs are just a little bit more harmful for humans and the environment as other drugs. Um, again, uh, I think we should give a warm applause to Annabelle, and I think she's symbolic for the, the spirit of Mexico that against all people, that against all odds are still fighting for justice. And uh, I think we also should be very happy that we in the Netherlands, uh, we have our own problems, but uh, we live still in a very safe space compared with uh, the, this uh, beautiful country of Mexico. Thank you very much. Well, first, um, thank you to the Bail, to Bailey, to invite me to this and give me this opportunity to speak about what is happening in Mexico. And of course, and um, most important, thank to you for your interest at, and uh, for your time to to come here. That stalks me with the same persistence as it does the victims of corruption and human rights abuses. I can't stop investigating their cases and write, them about, and, and write about them. One leads me inevitably to the other, and I can't escape from either. I refuse to remain silent and become and became become accomplice to a crime and impunity in my country. I'm a Mexican journalist. I have been working in this for the last 24 years. And for the past 12 years, I have been focused on investigating the links between the political and commercial entities and the drug cartels, forces disappearance, and systematic torture that exists in my country, Mexico. I have been given voices, voice to the victims and undercover proofs that implicate the leaders of our republic in those crimes. crimes. Residents, secretaries of states, police chiefs, and military officers. As a result of, of my work, my life has been under threat since 2010, when a powerful group of corrupt police chiefs who remain in power ordered my death because I undercovered the links with the Sinaloa cartel, which, according with the government of the United States, is the most po powerful drug trafficking organization in the world. Ever, ever, ever since, I have, I, have, I have lived with 24-hour protection, if you can call that living. And during the past seven years, other public figures, officers, uncomfortable with my work, angry, because I have um, discover all the ties, all the corruption inside of these institutions. Also want to want my death. Even that, I continue to practice journalism every day. They never cease arousing me, are harassing me with their threats. And I never cease my investigations. But my story is just one little, little sample of what hundreds of Mexican journalists who dare to speak truth to the murders, to the corruption, to the corrupt people, and those who abuse of power experience on daily basis. I have survived. Yes. But 132 Mexican journalists have been killed in the last decade. More than 18 have been disappeared 
Their voices are not longer heard. Their articles are not longer read. Under the government of Vicente Fox, 35 journalists were killed. On the regime of Felipe Calderón, 60. In the present government of Enrique Peña Nieto, 37 journalists have been murdered. Just 11 this year, just 11 this year. But they are not just cold numbers. Our people, the journalist, Jose Armando Rodriguez, was killed in Ciudad Culiacán on the morning of November 13 of 2008 in his car in front of his eight-year-old daughter. Someone shot him nine times. The journalist Maria, Maria Esther Aguilar, married mother of two daughters, disappeared on the morning of November 11 of, of 2011 on, sorry, of November 11 of 2009 in Michoacán. No one knows where she is now. The body of the reporter Evali, Evaristo Pacheco Solis was found on March 12th on 2010, abandoned in the highway in the state of Guerrero with five bullets, one of his head and four more in his chest. Juan Francisco Rodriguez Rios, another journalist from Guerrero, and his wife, Maria Elvira Hernandez, were killed with seven shots on June 28, on 2010, in the Internet Café they run. Regina Martinez, correspondent in Veracruz, was found dead and, uh, at her home in Jalapa on April 29 of 2012. Her face and her body had been beaten. She died of strangulation. May 3, 2012, World Press Freedom Day. The remains of three journalists and one of their girlfriends, Esteban Rodriguez, Gabriel Huge, Guillermo Luna, and Iracema Becerra, appeared in trash bags in one canal in the city of Veracruz. They had been brutally tortured before being killed, after which they were dismembered. The Mexican photographer and journalist, Ruben Espinosa, was killed on July 30, 31 of, of 2015 in a neighborhood of Mexico City. He was found naked, with a bullet in his brain. Aurelio Campos, the director of a newspaper in Puebla, was murdered on September 14 of 2016 while he was driving along the highway. The morning of March 27 of 2017, the journalist Miroslava Bridge was shot in her car, and she left her home um, and beside uh, her, her home in Chihuahua, in the city of Chihuahua, when she was taken to her young son to school, who watched her die on the last May. The journalist Javier Valdez were killed by 12 shots in the middle of the street in Culiacán, Sinaloa. He was my friend. He was my colleague. In Mexico, freedom of express doesn't exist. Those who dare to taste it, either life miserable, with pistol guns in their heads, or they died. Mexico has become one of the most dangerous countries for a journalist because it is difficult to make the differentiation between the drug traffickers, the government, the businessman, and the church. Because most of the time, they are together. They work together. They are in the same bed. They eat in the same table. 
and sharing the same sports, the citizens of Mexico. The truth is that the 15 most powerful economy in the world, Mexico is the 15 most powerful economy in the world, is in really a lawless narco state without justice, where more than 107,000 people have been murdered in the last 10 years, and more than 30,000 people have been disappeared since the beginning of the so-called war on drugs. But hundreds hiding graves cannot cover up this corruption and impunity. And survivors' tears prevent the infamy from being victims of these people. Attacks on freedom of express in Mexico occur every day, every hour, everywhere. Because the Mexican journalists have to become kind of prosecutors in Mexico. More than 98% of the crimes that occur in Mexico, not just the murder of the journalists, every crime, the 98% of every crime that occurs in Mexico is impugned. Since 2006, 2007, many journalists um, have to become kind of prosecutors because this impunity. We have to go to the scene of the crimes. We have to get the testimonies from the witness. We have to find uh, these uh, secret documents, videos, that proves that in many of these cases of massacres, disappearance that occur in Mexico are committed not just by the cartels, as many people think, by the Mexican government, is committed also by the officials from the Mexican government, sometimes involved with the drug cartels, sometimes not. But always is one, uh, one ofi officer from the Mexican government involved in these kind of crimes. That's why the impunity is the rule in Mexico and not the justice, because this Journalists became very uncomfortable. I know that many people ask to themselves, why? Why is it not a clear war in Mexico? Why the journalists have been murdered? Why? Which is the explanation? This is the explanation. This, in this government, in the government of Enrique Peña Nieto, have been accused five massacres. These five massacres, the Mexican government said an official story about them. Tlatlaya, Estado de México, eh, Iguala, Guerrero, Tanoato, Michoacán, eh, Apatzingán, Michoacán, y um, en Oaxaca, occur uh, different kinds of massacres, five massacres in this government. And the government said one official story, where the journalist that discover that in all these cases, the Mexican government were involved, was involved. So that's why journalists in Mexico became very uncomfortable. And that's why the cartels and the, all the levels of Mexican government want to the journalists dead. Why? Who is really the big victim of all these things? The society. Because in one failed state, as it, as it is Mexico now, the only option to the society to have accurate information in the correct time, to be able to be free to take their own decisions, the only barrier between the lies and the truth now are the journalists. Not the politicians, not the church, not the law. It's the, are the journalists. And this is why many journalists have been murdered in, in Mexico. 
Um, Balzac used to say that there, there are two kinds of stories, of story. The official story that usually is a lie, that usually just said um, what the government is for what the government is convenient, and the truth. The work of any journalist in the world is find this truth. Disappear the lies. Give light where is where is darkness. And I really, I really, I really, I really believe on this. One of the most infamous events in the last few decades in Mexico is the disappearance of the 43 students, the sons of peasants, the poorest of the poor. They were between 16 and 23 years old. They were studying in the Raul Isidro Burgos Rural Teachers College in Ayotzinapa, Guerrero. On the night of September 26 of 2014 in Iguala, the more than 100 uh, students from this school were attacked. Uh, three of them were murdered and 43 disappeared. The official story of Enrique Peña Nieto is that the crime was committed by a mayor as his, and his wife and a very poor local police and a small group of supposed uh, members of uh, one little gang in Guerrero. The truth is that um, who was um, who had the biggest responsibility about this crime is the military, the 27 battalion, and about 43 uh, officers from the federal police, from the municipal police, and the state police. All of them under the orders of one very important uh, drug lord that uh, was controlling that area of Guerrero because he controlled the production of heroin that is produced here, there. And um, he ordered to the, to the military attack to the students. Um, the government, the Mexican government until now have been trying to, to, to disappear all the evidence about this. I, I was able to, to, to really clarify the case. And because this, my life um, start to be in danger, in danger again. In Mexico, the price of speaking true to the power is paid in tears and blood. There is always an option to keep silent. Yes, save own skin and look the other way when these crimes take place in front of your eyes. But seven years ago, I released that is not enough to survive this barbarity. Living to keep silent is not living. Not anywhere on this planet. Not for me. Living to keep silent about how corruption, crime, and impunity continue to destroy my country and destroy innocent people is another way of dying. I have no doubt this sentiment, this feeling is not unique to me. It's shared by dozens, hundreds of journalists in Mexico who continue the fight in defense of the right of the society to be informed, taking the official dark version of story to pieces to bring the truth to light, no matter what is the price. 
the international community shares a very big responsibility for what is happening in Mexico. If it keeps silence, became accomplice. If they buy Mexican oil without caring that this black gold is tainted with the blood of the Mexicans, it becomes accomplices. Mexico, Mexico has experienced more than a decade of serious human rights violation, while the international community looks on apparently unmoved by our tragedy. I am afraid, afraid of dying like my colleagues, like Javier. Afraid about my two children. Afraid that maybe I will not be able to see them or hug them anymore. But my worst fear is not be dead. My worst fear is becoming indifferent and losing the power of myself to fight against all this. I don't want to become one more statistic among the number of the dead journalists. Of course, I don't want to. I don't want to die as a victim. I also don't believe that journalists are heroes. No one is. We didn't want to be. It's true, dead versus me. But so does that the hope that by not keeping silent, these things will change. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Uh, you okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First, shall I get you some water? Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, this left me almost speechless. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about um, what it's like to live with this constant fear of, you know, knowing that people are out to get you? Since when have you known that your life was in danger? My father was kidnapped and murdered on December of 2000. Because of your work? No, because he was a victim as many other victims in Mexico. Since that moment, I really realized that the crisis in Mexico can take, uh, can, can disappear everything I love in one minute. And I have learned that, yes, my story is like I said, but I have to clarify that, of course, I'm not the only victim. The problem in Mexico is that no one, even the richest man, that Carlos Slim, than the poorest man, no one can say that they live uh, with uh, calm. No one can say that they are safe. No one can say that they will survive to the other day. So I learned to, to live with this fear as any Mexican. I mean, it's not, it's not something extraordinary. When you live under this kind of danger every day, not just as a journalist, as a citizen, you really, you really understand that it's not just your situation, it's the situation of ma more than 100 millions that lives in Mexico. No matters where. Could be in Mexico City, the murder of Ruben Espinosa occurred in Mexico City, all the attacks against my, my home occurs in Mexico City, the shootings against my uh, sources occur in Mexico City, the murder of my sources occur in Mexico City. I mean, this can happen everywhere, in the north, in the, in the center, of, in the south of Mexico. Everything is the same. And, and you lived abroad for a while? Um, but now you've decided to go back to Mexico. I, I was noticed about this plan to murder me, to kill me. I, it wasn't a call, phone call to tell me I will kill you. I think that would be a good notice. And because when someone talks, no, means something. But when it's 
or just the silent, you have to be very worried about it. Mm. So uh, thanks that uh, one source that wor works inside of the um, federal police, he participated in one meeting wh where uh, was head by the Secretary of Public Safety of Mexico, the minister, and he ordered to all these police to kill me because he was very angry about the, all the information that I revealed in my book, um, Narcolan. But I resist. I resist from 2010 to 2014. What really makes me have to go out from Mexico was not me, even my family. I was, I was ready, ready, I was ready to, all, to take all the risk, even the life of my kids. But on December of 2013, 11 gone men get inside to, to get inside to the place where I live, where other neighbors, they get inside to their homes, they put the guns in their heads, even kids of five or six years old, asking where I live. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. But all my neighbors suffered this nightmare that night. When, uh, when I was noticed, I came back immediately. And when I really see that I became a, 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 a danger, not just for me and for my kids, also for many people that was around, I got conscious that I didn't have the right to do this. So I decide to leave Mexico because I don't want that more innocent people died because of me. So um, I found an option. Um, UC Berkeley in California gave me a uh, scholarship and I left Mexico and I went to California on August of 2014. I really have to confess, I Though that I got enough, that I didn't want to be a danger for others, that it was the time to take time for me and my kids, I offered to the university make an investigation about the Sinaloa cartel in Los Angeles, because of <laughs> course they are everywhere. They were not a very peaceful <laughs> issue, but I think that of course, I mean, I have heard that any journalists in the United States have been more than in the last 10 years. So. Um, but um, the disappearance of the 43 students occurred on September of 2014. And that, I have to say, forced me to go back to Mexico. I just couldn't ignore the pain of all these mothers and fathers. I don't know if you can, but I can't. I saw the pictures. I heard the testimonies of all these um, people, very poor people, looking for their sons, because their sons were all for them. So uh, I couldn't be indifferent, and I forced to the university to change the issue of my investigation. They didn't want to, so I said, OK, I quit. I finish here, I, go, I will go back with, to Mexico with my kids because I have to do this research. So the university accept to change the issue of my investigation and they support this investigation related with the 43 students by two years and I was able to publish my book on, last, on December of 2016. I'd like to ask, um, we're going to, can we put on some lights in the audience? Because uh, I would like to get the audience involved. But as you ponder uh, any questions you may have, I wanted to ask you, um, what does it mean to you when you feel you have the support of other journalists, when you're invited to internationally, when, when we can shine a very small spotlight on Mexico? Because you, you mentioned your anger, and this is what the panel will be about, the international dimension, the complicitness of, of countries and governments in basically the silence that surrounds Mexico. What does it mean to you to be here? And what, um, what basically is the homework that you would give us? Well, I, of, 
I'm sorry. Uh, uh, of course, I am hungry all the time, and I don't want to offense to anyone. But you are naive if you think that this, this is just our problem. You have not understand anything if you think that Mexicans became crazy and now they kill each other because they are stupid. And this is a, a tercer, un país tercermundista. A and world country. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this is not about us. No, for me, came to this kind of conference is the opportunity to, to tell to the people this is your problem. This is your problem. Not to the people, also to the governments. I have been having discussions with many governments, ambassadors of different countries in, in, in Mexico, telling them uh, this is your responsibility. You are part of this. Not just because you don't claim to the Mexican government, not because you don't take to every president of Mexico to the one international court and to make him pay for his crimes. No, not just for that. Because uh, in all these um, good economic, healthy economics, is, I mean, is a paradise for all these narcos that are killing people in Mexico. Not because you love drugs and you love to consume all these drugs that are produced in Mexico and is, are, is killing people every day. Not just because that. Also because many of the international banks laundry their money. So it's the big business here. Yes, maybe it's people and cartels in Mexico is, is, is uh, the violence is brutal, yes. And in Mexico, uh, Me Mexico produce most of the heroin and metafetamines that are distributed in, in all the world. Mexico is the biggest producer of these things. And Mexico uh, is the, has almost the monopoly, the Mexican cartels has almost the monopoly of all the cocaine that are produced in Bolivia, Peru, Colombia. And with tights, with drangheta and other crime organizations here in Europe, they distribute the drugs. But um, they also laundry the money here. I mean, the case of HSBC, a UK bank, no a Mexican bank, a UK bank, uh, is very clear. They helped to the Sinaloa cartel to launder more than 80 millions of dollars, and no one of the bank went in jail. They just pay a little fee, and I said, it's a little fee. Looks like a fee because they pay just a little part of um, penalty, uh, just some money, and they continue doing laundry this money, I mean, with all the impunity. So for me, it came to this kind of conference is just to, to speak and tell all these things and, and, and hope to make reflect to the people the role of everyone in this mess in Mexico and these massacres. Thank you. I don't know if there's already any questions. Yes, sir, would you like to... Um, the microphone will come to you. Oh, sorry, my name is Fernando. Uh, she just told me to talk fast. Okay, really fast. No, oh, sorry. Uh, it's really easy. It's not HSBC only. It's también Rabobank, the Dutch bank. Uh, I have sued personally for the disappearance of my uh, family and for laundering the money. Sorry, are, you, are you Mexican? Yes, I am. And, uh, well, quizás sabes, uh, there is a case in the civil court right now against Rabobank. And uh, one of the things that we tried to do, of course, when denouncing, was to bring the case home. Of course, we don't have the proofs that the, the, the bank is uh, ordering the, the killing of Mexican people, but Annabella is saying it's, there is this uh, money laundering that is happening by international banks, and is, there is an investigation in the U.S. Uh, from the Fed against Rabobank, which is a Dutch bank, and it's still almost one year since we put this uh, civil complaint, we haven't heard anything from the Dutch authorities. Thank you for that. Do you yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, um, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, I mean, the most important banks in the United States I, are involved in this. I have seen, um, I, I have to say, dozens of uh, 
uh, indictments in courts in in United States, and when Los Zetas, when the Cartel del Golfo, the uh, uh, Cartel de Sinaloa, laundry the money, they they don't. I mean, it's not a Mexican bank. Maybe Van Norte is the has a little little piece of Mexicans, but all the banks that works in Mexico is the international banks. So. The truth is that this money, this dirty, uh, bloody money, moves the economy in the world. And that's why I, I always said that really doesn't exist. We have to be honest. Really doesn't exist any war against the drugs cartels in the world. Not just in Mexico, in the world. This war just doesn't exist. It's just... Uh, just um, uh, worst, but it's nothing real. Okay. There's a question over there, the lady on the left, please. Hello, my name is Pamela. I'm also a journalist in the Netherlands. Um, I was wondering, it's not entirely related to your story, but a lot of people here now are watching a lot of Netflix series, and there's a lot of attention actually for Narcos and El Chapo and a lot of popular culture now also about the cartels and I was I was wondering if this doesn't make you really angry how do you feel about these kind of series and movies well I, I think that is an excellent uh, question because of course I I think that all these series is just for stupid people sorry 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 Narcos asked me to write to help them to write the script to do that, and I said, no. The producer uh, have uh, several appointments with me, and I said, no. And I was, I, when I said, okay, maybe I can do that. If you do it accurate, if you really want to toil, to tell to the world the real story about the drugs, that's perfect. We have to start with the CEA. We have to start with the US government. We have to start with saying that thanks to the CEA, Pablo Escobar became the king of the drugs in the world. Thanks to the CEA. Not because Pablo was very smart or because he was very uh, brave. No, because, they, I mean, if the CEA helped me to create the most important business of drugs, of course I will be successful, even if I don't know how to write and read as a chapel. This is the case of El Chapo. The Chapo is an illiterate man. He left the school when he was six years old. He doesn't know if he if he wants to write a letter, a love letter for one of their his girlfriends, he can't. He has to ask for help, please, please. I have to say something. Because he can't. So the problem of this series is that they don't say the truth. To make really a very, very serious series about this, you have to start with this, with the CEA, with um, HSBC, with um, all these governments in Europe community. I mean, you have to start for that, because all the rest is folklore. El Chapo, El Mayo, Escobar, all these names are just nothing because they are just little pieces inside the bigger game. And the bigger game, who control this bigger game, is just a few people, the richest man of the people, as always. So I think that the problem with this series is that they distortion the truth. And that is terrible. Uh, I don't know uh, which could be the impact of this kind of series in, in Holland, but I can tell you that in Mexico, in many countries of Latin America, these series are terrible because kids think that, oh, yes, it's very uh, nice. I want to become one of them. No? For example, one of the discussions that I have with the producer of Narcos uh, uh, is that he, he said that I, I hired to one Mexican actor, very handsome and young, to make the role of Amado Carrillo Fuentes, one of the worst um, uh, and dangerous uh, drug lords in Mexico. And I said, what? What did you do? 
yes, yes, yes. You know this, this uh, Chema, I don't know which is the name of the actor, but he's very handsome. And I said, but Amado wasn't that, wasn't like that. Amado was big, fat, I mean, was ridiculous, was disgusting. Why you change the truth? Why don't, sh why, why don't you show in the TV show one guy really similar than Amado? That will be very, 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 very honest. But if you show this handsome, thin man being uh, the El Señor de los Cielos, the Lord of the Sky, uh, the most, one, of the mo the, one of the most important drug lords in the, in, in the, the case of the 90s, the people will say, the kids will say, oh yes, of course, I want to be like him. But that is not the truth. Amado, yes, Amado Carrillo Fuentes was able to have many, many beautiful women, actresses, and all these things, not because he was handsome. Many times he raped them. Many times he forced them. I mean, you will never see this in this kind of series. And I think that if you cannot see how really is this world, you, you, are, you are just help them to be more powerful. Right. Thank you very much. There's a couple more questions and then we're going to move to, uh, to the panel. But let's take um, the lady back there first and then the gentleman over here. Or oh, this is fine. Yeah. Sorry, the lady over here. Yes. Um, don't you, could, uh, this is just an observation, but is the mafia in uh, Mexico similar to the uh, capitalism state that we have in Western Europe? That's one statement. And uh, also in um, Mexico, sometimes uh, some drug lords uh, pray to San Muerto. Do you have any information on that? San Muerto is like the Cal Calacas and the Day of the Dead. I've seen information on that through the business examiner. No, no, no. Again, the, this last question, I don't, I don't get okay. it. Sorry. Um, yeah, it was one question. Yeah, so the, some drug lords in Mexico pray to a cult-like god called San Muerto. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. yeah. If this is true? Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not, I have to say that not just uh, narcos, many, many, many ignorant people in Mexico uh, does this, yes. Maybe it's for, for the people who don't know that. Could you say a little bit more about it? Is it a <sighs> voodoo uh, no, alternative no, no, religion? No, no, no. It's like a virgin. It's like a virgin. It's like a little secta inside. Because of, they are, of they are, they are, no, no, no. They are, ca they are the Catholic? Catholic, yeah. but also they, are, they adore to this figure because, you know, uh, in, many, in many ways, uh, the Catholics just adore to some figures, no, virgins, all these things. So, yes, yeah, in Mexico, many people adore to the Virgen de Guadalupe, and uh, some people adore to this kind of uh, the. It's like uh, the Virgin of the Dead, right? Something like that. Because you've made you you made uh, uh, allusions in your your speech uh, to the collusion of the church, the Catholic Church. Yeah. Um, uh, well, not just in Mexico. Is it who really controls the mafia by many decades in Italy was the Vatican. So this is not new. But yes, I mean, the problem is that in, in Mexico, because the church, the Catholic Church, have been in the power by many, many years, part of the power, uh, they, they have... The church, uh, how can I say, how can I, how can I say the accurate thing? Are accomp accomplices uh, with the cartels. I mean, they receive money from the cartels to build church. The priests go to the weddings. The church, uh, the priest go to when one capo is dead. I mean, the presence of the church is important. And for the narcos, even of course, they are not any kind of Catholic. I mean, if we are talking about some serious Catholic. Uh, but um, for them, be close to the church is very important. It gives legitimacy, uh, cover, a sense of... In front of the society. Right. Of course, I'm sure that they, they don't care about uh, 
Jesus Christ or nothing like that. They care about if the priest, if the obispo, how you say the obispo, uh, bishop, is beside me, the people will be beside me because Mexico is a very important Catholic um, country. Yeah. Do you think if the church would take a stand against corruption and violence and drugs? Never. But if they would, would it help the they people fight never. back? They can't. Because? They depend, that the mo that, 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 that they depend every time more than that of that money. Because, for example, as you know, the Catholic Church is in a huge crisis. This is not new. Of course, they, that is, they, they are losing a lot of uh, the votes in the world, more in Mexico and America Latina. So who will give the, to the church to survive? Also, the church depends much every time more than of this money. Right. Okay, thank you. There was one more question, and then I'm going to go to the panel. And please save your questions then, for because Annabel will also be on the panel. Yes, please. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have a question, obviously. Um, in Mexico, there is, most of the times, uh, more than one type of discrimination, so double discrimination. In this case, you are a woman. How does sexism affect uh, female journalists? Is there any difference between uh, male journalists and female? When I have to say, in the, in the case about violence against the journalist, doesn't matter. Even if you want to talk about uh, the sex issue, many journalists that have been murdered, men or women, have been raped, for example. Uh, before that, no matter if you are a woman or a man, because um, rape, as in other many countries, is part of the torture um, against the, the person. In, in terms of how difficult is that um, uh, do this kind of job, for example, my kind of job, I, I have to work uh, this narco world, if you want to call it like that, uh, is managed by men and it took me a lot of time, many years, to be able to talk uh, seriously with many of these heads of the cartels. I was able to make interviews with members of the cartels, with the hitmans of the cartels, with the lawyers of the cartels, and it took me time. Um, it took me time, but I think that at, at the last moment, be a woman help me to to open more doors in that in that in that world because maybe I think that they saw me like oh, it's a woman how dangerous could be <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know me of course <laughs> thank you thank you very okay. much this is a very good moment to uh, to move to the two members of our panel that I'm going to invite up here. The first one is Jos Bartman, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam from the Department of Politics, uh, and a team member of the project Authoritarianism in a Global Age, which is um, funded by the European Research Council, which only funds the very best academics in, in Europe, so no pressure there, uh, Jos. And uh, his current, for his current research, he's actually been to Veracruz in Mexico, where he's interviewed both the targets and the executioners of political repression. And I think the interesting thing about your work is that you don't stay at the national level, but you look at the, at the local level, and, and you do that in a comparative way. So if you'll please come and join us up here. Thank you. Can we have, give him a warm welcome already? Thanks. Okay. And then, for probably many of the Dutch people, Marijn de Waal does not need any introduction because he's a um, foreign editor at NRC, one of our best uh, national newspapers, and he specialized in, in Latin America. And of course, in November, he wrote an in-depth piece, uh, in case you missed it, on the situation in Mexico and gave insight into the way that death and violence have become a normal way of life, like you have already described it. Every Mexican lives with it. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, Marijn. 
So, Jos, I want to start with you because uh, you were in Veracruz. Can you tell us a little bit about what you saw there, about your research there? Um, well, it, it really resonates with the story of, of Annabelle. Uh, I came in there not with a specific interest in, uh, uh, in the attacks on the freedom of speech, but uh, my research is about subnational authoritarianism. So authoritarian regimes not on the nation state, but on the province state or on the, on the, on the, on the state level, so subnational. But um, um, why, really why did you pick Veracruz? Where, how did you Veracruz, end up there? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Veracruz has, a, has the pre in power, um, the political party that is in power on the central level now as well in Mexico, and it basically has dominated that state for almost 100 years, basically, since the beginning of the 20th century. So if a political party is in power for, for that amount of time, that, that's a big canary in the coal mine that indicates that, that something is wrong with democracy, right? Um, so it has been able to exert a certain amount of influence over the local economy. It has screwed the electoral playing field in the sense that opposition parties did not stand a chance. Um, and the question I tried to answer there was how, do, how does a regime like this use repression? Uh, so I came in with quite an exploratory agenda there, but, but soon stumbled upon the, a community of, of, of critical journalists. Um, and you really have to imagine a, a fairly small community. Uh, this is not a community of hundreds of critical journalists, but a small community of, well, they claimed that there, there were basically 20 to 40, not more journalists that were really daring to write critically. And w what I mean with critically is, is, is compromising information. So, for example, corruption, scandals, disappeared money at some, por some sort of department or links between organized crime and the subnational state. Um, they all knew people that were killed. They had colleagues, friends, uh, people that were killed. They, they, they all knew uh, at least more than one person that was killed. Um, yeah, and, it, and it, it, they, they were very astonishingly aware of the fact that um, there's a, there was a big likelihood that they would not become old. Um, Ruben Espinoza, the person that was killed um, a couple of months after my research, I can still remember that he, that's exactly what he said, like, in the end, I know that I'm probably not going to be this old. So this awareness is really there, and that, that really struck me. Yeah. And how does the, because you investigate how they do the repression, how does it work, the repression, at, yeah. at that state level? Um, well, so it, this is really interesting. In a Mexican case, uh, Annabelle has done an amazing job of connecting the dots between organized crime and, and lower levels of government. But what is really, really terrible is that Case by case, so if a Mexican journalist is killed, we don't know exactly who has ordered the killing. We don't know because the evidence is not there. There are no serious processes, so we cannot basically rely on anything. And it could be either the government or drug cartel. Uh, and, and the problem is really that they have a shared interest in, uh, in silencing journalists. So, for example, the former governor of, of Veracruz, it's known that this person received campaigning money, right? Money for that campaign. If a a government like that has such big skeletons in the closet, both the subnational government and um, a, a cartel or a drug trafficking organization that gives that money benefits from silencing these, um, these journalists. So their, their interests are really aligned. Were you scared working there? I mean, what's it like as a researcher from Amsterdam to, to walk in there and to meet these people who are risking their lives? to try to fight for a better future, and you're sitting there interviewing them. How does that work? Yeah, it, it was humbling, of course, and it became much more humbling, actually, when Ruben Espinoza got killed, because then I really realized, uh, uh, okay, this is, this is really happening. And of course, when people tell you that, you realize that, you realize that only in uh, halfway, basically. Um, I think it's a b big difference. Uh, these killings are very calculated. They're not just random street killings. Um, the people who, who engage in these killings are aware of the political cost and the political benefits um, that these killings bring about, uh, and which results in the fact that it's, it's not as interesting to kill uh, a, a Westerner or, or a person that is uh, Dutch or probably uh, look just like an American, so that's protecting me probably even more. But um, yeah, this is a very, very, very big difference, I think. Right. Thank you. I, Marianne, I want to go to you. So you wrote this in-depth article. You, you knew Mexico already, but mm -hmm. then you have all these unresolved crimes, mass killings, uh, nothing being done. So can you talk a little bit more about your article and especially the way that death and violence have become completely normal in the life of every Mexican? Well, well this l last article I wrote was in uh, Ciudad Juarez, which is on the um, uh, north border. and. 
I went there during the Day of the Death, El Día de los Muertos, uh, when the, most Mexicans go to the cemeteries to, to visit the graves of their loved ones that have deceased. And I went to two graveyards. Uh, one was called the El Cementerio de los Pobres, so it was more like the, the, the poor man's graveyard. And I went to another one, what was more known like a, a middle class uh, graveyard. And first I was a bit nervous, well, will it be possible to find anybody who has lost somebody recently d during the violence in Juarez? But I was only there for 20 minutes and I already found people that uh, have had lost people a couple of weeks ago on the poor man's cemeteries. And then I went to the middle class cemetery and even there people uh, were mourning their loved ones uh, that they have lost during a shootout. Uh, not, not, not only people that were involved in crime, but also just being on, in the wrong place at the wrong time, and just in the crossfire and they deceased. So I think nowadays, um, lower class Mexican, middle class Mexicans, they are, they are just so vulnerable. And I think only the elite and higher class, they can, well, they can hide in their gated communities. They can have their uh, seguridad privada, their private security. Um, and even then, they're not, they're, they're not safe anymore. Um, so I think nowadays, every Mexican is, is, is counting with the, the risk of being, uh, well, being, uh, being victim of, of the crime. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I think it's important to note that it wasn't always like this. I lived in El Paso in uh, 1981, and uh, we went to Ciudad Juarez, which is right across the border, three times a week. Uh, great shopping. 20% um, uh, of the girls in my, my girls' school came every day by bus. Uh, the border was basically open, and, um, and it was a relatively safe, uh, well-organized place to go. And then it's, it's terrifying to see how quickly, actually, something can descend into, into almost a state of absolute violence. It's interesting what you are saying, because uh, even you see on 1981, you said, mm -hmm. that everything seems peaceful. The, Sinal the cartel of Juarez was already there with all their dirty business. I mean, if you think that because Mexico seems peaceful, for a long time, this doesn't mean that the problem was already there. Right. And I think that that was the biggest problem because the, the society in Mexico, and I can tell you that was the, 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 the same case is Monterrey, Ciudad Juarez, Guadalajara, Acapulco, and many other important cities. The people know that these cities grows a lot because the money of the narcos. So when the money of the narcos were buying, um, co constructing hotels where they were buying a lot of cars, that way they were renting a lot of houses, when they, uh, how can I say, it, spread money, was not a problem. Seems that was not a problem. That when, but when they start to spread blood, people said, oh, what happened? What happened? That you live with them by the case. Right. The problem was always there. Many, many women, as you said, in the decade, as you know, in the decade of the 90s, in Ciudad Juarez, start to be murdered, brutally. And even that, even that the problem was huge, all the society was very indifferent. When not just this kind of woman, poor woman that used to work in these kind of fabrics, also, when other kind of women of all the levels of the society in Juarez start to be murdered, so the people start to care about that. But the problem is that this problem that we have in Mexico, of course, didn't start suddenly. No. Have a long, long, long time there, quiet, and then explode. That's why I'm saying that this is very dangerous, not just for Mexico, also for the world. If you think that you are safe because you are very far from Mexico, you are wrong. Because even all the, all the things in this kind of countries like yours seems very peaceful, the big game is here again. 
the big trade of, traf of drugs, the big uh, game of laundry money. I mean, they are here. They are silent until now. But see the example of Mexico. Seems that everything uh, explodes suddenly, I mean, occurs suddenly, but not. Was a long time there. Yeah, thank you very much. So before we go to the responsibility of the international community, I want to go to Marijn because there are elections coming. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is, there's of course, seems to be a very clear connection between some of the established parties and everything that's going on, um, whether it's at the local level or of course at the national level. Can you tell us a bit more about the context and whether anything will, is likely to change? Are the Mexicans fed up yet with this system? Is it a democracy? Well, Mexico, until the turn of the century, was always called uh, la, di la dictadura perfecta, so the di perfect dictatorship, because the, the pre, there were, all, there were elections, but the pre always won until 2000, and then we had two presidents from a different party, and now we have uh, a president from the pre again. And the thing is, Mexico will go to the ballot boxes on the 1st of July, and it will really be a strange electoral landscape this time because there will be a lot of independent, so-called independent candidates, apart from the candidates from the, the big parties. So, because there's only one round in Mexico, uh, in theory you can win with 15 or 20 percent of the vote. Um, so the pre, it's, it, they are really uh, unpopular now because uh, the actual president is, had really a really <laughs> disastrous job, and um, but still maybe they, with all the old ways, they tend to buy votes. Maybe they can buy enough votes to to maintain the the presidency. Otherwise, one other uh, contender uh, is called AMLO, Andres Manuel López Obrador. He's more of a left wing uh, candidate, and maybe he can win. But he has tried twice before and he lost twice, and especially in 2006, he, he lost uh, after a, a recount, which was really strange, because during the recount, he lost a lot of votes. So it, I don't know if you can call uh, Mexico a democracy, but uh, they, they have elections, <laughs> and um, we, we have to see, because all these different uh, individual candidates, they, they make that with, with only 15 or 20 percent of the votes, we can have a president. Yeah. Yeah. Annabel, do you vote? Do, who do you vote for in Mexico? Who does one vote for if you want to change it in the way, the vision you have of a corrupt, violent, uncorrupt, violent free society? Of course I vote. But I think that any president in Mexico by the, is, he himself will be able to resolve this huge huge crisis. I think that um, part of the destiny of, the, of Mexico, of course, is in the hands of the, of the society. So I think that um, every society has the responsibility to follow to the authorities and force them to do their job. And I think uh, that's what uh, Mexico, Mexico society, society have, to, have to do. In my personal, very, 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 very personal point of view, I think that um, any candidate is the correct candidate for Mexico. I really think that all this system of parties in the world uh, is collapsed. Those, uh, for me, in my point of view, in any part of the world, world uh, this system of parties really doesn't work anymore because the parties doesn't represent really the interest of the people. So I think that we have to reveal and uh, think about all this issue to, to, to find a new model of this. But uh, the election in next July will be between parties and some fake uh, independent candidates. Candidates. So I think that even any any of them are perfect of the ideal. Ideal, ¿cómo se dice? Ideal, ideal. I think that the the only option that we have is be radicals, radicals, radicals. And I think the Andres Manuel López Obrador is the only option. Maybe not to get the things better but at least 
break some of these issues that just don't work in Mexico. Jos, you saw it at the local level in Veracruz. How does the PRI locally collude with the national uh, government? What is the, what is the magic power violence connection there? Um, well, generally speaking, the, the center leaves these regimes alone, generally speaking. So, for example, you have to imagine that the, the PRI in Veracruz uh, generates a big voting reservoir for the PRI at the, centra, at the central elections. Um, and it can vote with the PRI in uh, Congreso. So they're voting partners, they're strategic partners. So as long as things do not get too much out of hand, I think the general rule is that the center leaves subnational regimes like that alone. But what is not too much out of hand? Dead journalists, people disappearing, mass yeah. murders, unresolved crimes. There has to be a point where somebody yeah. says, this is too much. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that it's, it's, uh, it, it could be true that the, the PRI will be in power in Veracruz for much longer. Um, but I really wonder always, like, for example, Duarte has been, uh, has been picked up now. And I wonder whether that has to do with the fact that uh, the, the central regime wanted to show that it has good intentions and wanted to, to scapegoat this, the local regime for what it did. Um, so it does matter, and I think that, that that's the problem also. That's, that's the job that journalists do. They try to reveal the corruption that is going on at the subnational level, and if too much is, go is coming out, if too much skeletons are being released out of the closet, then at some point I think the center needs to at least do something. So again, the, the <laughs> subnational governments like the one in Veracruz do not want journalists. But, but this is, I think, is really important, and, and I think we should go to like our responsibility. I mean, us, the international community, the Netherlands, the European Union. Does it help your work, not only that you're here and, and, and sharing the truth, but does it help you if there are parliamentary questions, if if, if your government uh, gets uh, démarche, uh, di diplomatic démarche? Do these things help? Uh, in the case, for example, um, of the murder of the journalist, I have to say that um, this pressure, because I have to say, because it's true, that many of these countries have been put, have been trying to put pressure o over the Mexican government related with the murders of the journalist. But that uh, didn't didn't help really to resolve the cases, not to put really to the responsible people, to responsible people or in jail. Um, and I have to say that in general, in general, the international community have been very indifferent to all these uh, human uh, rights uh, violations in Mexico committed by the army, by the federal police, by different levels of the government, because I think that, that the international community is, is more interested in the oil in Mexico, is more interested to, be, to do business, to have cheap uh, um, mano de obra, how can I say it? Manual labor. Yeah. Than, than, than really be worried about uh, the lives of the people in Mexico. So I think that the international community has always uh, two faces. In relation with the freedom of press, I think, yes, it's a lot of letters of inter different countries, embassies, international organizations that claim to the Mexican government to resolve the crimes. Mm -hmm. um, they don't work. Uh, and on the other hand, in general, the international community is very indifferent about the deep issue in Mexico that is the corruption and the collusion between the government and the cartels and the organized crime. Now let's go very concretely to the Netherlands. I think it was you, Marijn, who made a connection with the Zuidas in investments actually mm -hmm. in Amsterdam. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I mean, all this criminal money has to be laundered. And since Amsterdam has a big financial sector, not only banks, but also the, uh, one of the key players in, in having all these structures to, to, to uh, whitewash money, uh, one of the big key players are the, the trust offices, uh, like Citco here in Amsterdam. 
played a role in uh, a construction that the former governor of um, um, Sonora, uh, he, he, he has diverted like, diverted like $8 million from the coffers to his personal accounts, and he did it by a construction via Amsterdam, New Zealand, and then uh, an American bank account. So these trust offices, they normally say, well, we, we, can't, we have to protect the privacy of our clients, and they normally don't uh, want to cooperate with justice um, uh, outside, of, uh, outside of Holland. But this time they did, and that's the only reason we know it, because normally they just say, no, we have to protect the, the, the privacy of our clients. So we really play a key role by, have, by facilitating all these kinds of uh, well, financial hocus-pocus during uh, all over the world. Does it make a difference to I mean, some of the banks involved, the ones that you've mentioned, uh, Rabobank, but uh, HSBC and some, some of the other ones, uh, if there's pressure from their shareholders, from their customers, uh, media exposure to say, look, you are facilitating the violation of a whole country, uh, this has to stop. Does that have, have any kind of impact? Could it? I don't think so. Sorry, I don't think so because I mean the rules. I mean, the, if the Banco Monetario Internacional said something, mm -hmm. sorry, IMF, the, yeah, say something, maybe, maybe, maybe the the banks will be care about that. But if just uh, the people said this, I mean, the banks take us our money every day. I mean, they ask for a huge, uh, uh, how, you, how you said, um, In, what? fees Fees, and yes. all these things, I mean, and people can claim, and they don't, they don't care because they are in the big game. So where it's just few people uh, give the orders. So I think that um, maybe we should not go to the bank anymore. That will be a sabotage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't put, if we don't put our money anymore in the bank, maybe they will change. Maybe know. they will change. If, do, if we don't see any more Netflix because they have this garbage, maybe they will change. The point is that I think, yes, the people have some power if they know how to use it. Asking, they will not hurt to anyone. Block the money, keep your money, because thanks to our money, they are able to launder money. Why? Because we, with our money, they make billions. They need these billions to launder the other money. If they don't have nothing, what, how they will do it? I mean, they, they are, I mean as a society, we, we have to do, think about all different kind of strategies to, to yeah, do I think. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add that it's, I think it's important to realize that these bank, banks have indirect diplomatic power. Um, uh, I think you, you mentioned the example of Rabobank, where the Dutch government was completely silent, but in the case of HSBC, the British government uh, exerted political diplomatic power over the, um, uh, the Justice Department in the United States to accept a settlement by H HSBC in order not to prosecute HSBC instead. Um, well, yeah. yeah no, that's, uh, that makes it very clear. We're going to come to the audience in, in, in a moment. But one of the things I think that's interesting is, you know, we in the Netherlands uh, at some point in the past um, decided to legalize what we call soft drugs, uh, marijuana. And when, um, uh, when, when I hear, hear this, I mean, one of the key questions, of course, is it's because it's illegal that it's so incredibly profitable to do all these drugs. So would legalization, would that be an answer, because then it would be maybe in government hand taxed, you could have a monopoly like they have in Sweden on alcohol, you could cut out the crime aspect of it, uh, leaving aside what you may think of drugs, uh, because I think one of the key takeaways from what you were saying tonight is use local drugs, don't buy international drugs, because that at least <laughs> would help a little bit. But, but what, do you, what would you, is that part, of, could that be part of a political solution? Many people used to say, uh, because it's easy, that legalization could, be the, could resolve all the problems about um, uh, black market. Mm -hmm. 
about violence, about all these things. The point is, United States, as you know, is the biggest, uh, the bigger consumer of drugs in the world. Yes. But the, the, bigger, the biggest drugs, is correct, yeah, that they consume are not illegal. No, they're are, a prescription medicine. Are, no, 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 no. Hold a second. Mm. Are legal drugs that they got by illegal way with fake prescriptions. So how can you dream if you are not able to control the pharmaceuticals? They, get, they pay taxes, no? Or uh, supposedly they are under the law. Supposedly they have to be monitoring. Supposedly they have to have auditor, uh, auditorias. How you? Audits? Yeah. But even that, they are able to make billions of dollars selling drugs, legal drugs, in the black market. Mm -hmm. So if you, in, in this moment, we are not able even to control the legal, pharmacy, uh, the legal companies that produce all these legal drugs, how can we really dream that we, are, we will be able to control the other business? I mean, again, I think that many of the people that talk about this legalization really don't have conscience how the, the game is. And again, the game is in just a small group, and the owners of the, the, the pharmaceuticals, I mean, all, all these people, is, if you search their names, are always the same. So I think that the discussion should be other. Mm -hmm. Why the, um, don't the international community decide to confiscate all this dirty money? Why the international community not decide to really um, put as a priority try to destroy the market, you have a, de uh, you have a market because you, because you have a demand. Mm -hmm. So why don't you really try to destroy the demand? For example, in Mexico right now, right now, in one country where the consumers of drugs grows 200% um, every two years, 200%. Of course, if you compare the quantity of the consumers in Mexico and United States, United States is huge in comparison of the Mexico. Mm -hmm. But the market of consumers in Mexico grows very quickly. Instead, the consumers in United States is all, doesn't move like uh, since, um, since many, many, many years ago. So how can you explain that um, in, in Mexico, where the consumers grow in this, uh, with this uh, velocity, doesn't exist any campaign, any campaign in the radio, any campaign in the, in the, in the, in the TV, any campaign anywhere against the consumer of drugs. I mean, it's a question, why? What kind of drugs, why, what kind of war against drugs could be if you don't attack the problem. And which is the problem? The consumers. This is the truth. The biggest problem of all these things uh, are the yeah. consumers. Can I just, I'd, I'd like to get some input on, on this question from Josse Marijn, because this is, of course, a very, the American example we know, but Europe is fundamentally different on many, many things from the US. The way we think about drugs, the way we think about sex, the way we think about guns, yeah. the way we think about politics, about democracy, about, about all these kind of things. So uh, putting the question to you, it, would legalization have some kind of, could it have some kind of role, leaving aside the, the, the well, huge problem of the US, which uh, for the moment. I don't know, because it's, it's it, the whole drugs market is demand driven. So y you have to, I think, uh, focus on the demand, uh, on the clients. And we always like to think about Holland like the big guide, guide country. But I think nowadays in Europe, the, the best country is, is Portugal. Oh, Portugal is they, they decriminalized uh, small possessions and they, especially the, the good thing they do, they don't uh, attack it as a, as a criminal problem, but as a public health issue. So if they, caught you, if they catch you with a bit of marijuana or cocaine, they send you to a social worker and he speaks with you and uh, the social worker tries to determine if you're just a recreational user or really a problematic user. 
I think that's the, the, the a way forward. Uh, it's not the only way forward, but that's the best way to get people more informed, to get people um, more, well, more informed about the risks, and so at least they take a calculated risk uh, by using these drugs. And um, I think it's also a bit too late to speak about legalization because the cartels are now so powerful, they infiltrated so many legal sectors of the economy that if even if you legalize cocaine, they will have enough other resources to maintain their power. Um, so I think that's a past station. Yeah. You also, because you do a lot of comparison uh, at, at the local level about repressive, uh, repressive authoritarian local regimes. I'm sure drugs is, is something that comes throughout. How would, you, how would you perceive this if you could take the Mexican case but compare it to some of the other parts of the world you've studied? I think it's more violent, to be really honest. Um, there's, there's other democracies that actually deal with similar problems. And in fact, um, uh, the top five um, uh, countries that are the most dangerous for journalists are all democracies, including India, for example, the Philippines. Uh, and in India, you see similar things, but the levels are just not as escalated. Uh, but you see, you see, for example, uh, rights to information activists, people that go after corruption scandals, local officials that are involved in corruption, people try to, to dig up that information, they're being killed. Yeah, that, that, it is the investigative role that makes it so dangerous. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to the audience. There were still some questions, I think, from, uh, from beforehand. Can we maybe get two or three questions together and then uh, please let us know who you would like to answer, but anyone in the panel, of course, is welcome, uh, welcome to. Let's start with the people who, don't, who haven't spoken yet. So the gentleman over here first. Hi, um, Annabel. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you. So my question is, um, do you think that the drug is just like a, uh, I, like a curtain? Because just look at the picture, so you need like a weaponry, you need military, you need, you need planes. So it looks like uh, the drugs is like a business for a level of criminals. But America is putting in Mexico to be able to sell more weaponry, to militarize the country. When you go to Mexico, you see just this military full of weaponry, so many cars. If they just put that money in the schools and <laughs> will be way different. So it looks like a, a curtain, the drugs, for other bigger business. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's take one or uh, one, two more questions. Um, you want to go over here for a second? Yes. Thank you. Hola, Nabel. Uh, my question is more regarding about the situation that you mentioned in Iguala and Guerrero with the Ayotzinapa, with the 43 students, which in my point of view was the inflection point that turned uh, the administration of Enrique Peña Nieto. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how the situation actually happened, if you probably know something we don't or that was never shared by the media, because we know how the media is controlled back in the country, right? So the, uh, my question is if you could elaborate more a little bit on the topic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's start with those two because they're quite comprehensive. Annabel, do you want to well, start? Well, I, I, I really think that the issue of drugs produce uh, many money for many people. Uh, one way, yes, is the, is the production of guns, is the production of uh, even uh, spy systems, no, as a pretext to, to, to fight against the, the drugs. But also, I think that um, um, through the same routes, routes yeah, that, 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 uh, that the cartels use to, to, to try, uh, used by the cartels to traffic drugs, they also traffic against um, weapons, uh, people. I mean, um, these cartels are important for many sectors of the economy because they, again, not just move drugs. They do many other kind of business. And I, I think that that's why no one wants to touch their money. Because, again, the money is the key of the things. For example, El Chapo Guzman now is in jail because this man wants to make a movie. Yeah, the problem is that. The problem is that. The problem is that uh, one day after escape the second time, the Chapo Guzman has this vision about I want to make a movie about my life and I want to tell the truth. 
After seeing Netflix, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> you will never see it because okay. no one wants that El Chapo said the truth. So, who wants to be in the movie of El Chapo? I mean, Carlos Salinas de Gortari, Ernesto Cedillo, eh, Enrique Peña Nieto, George Bush, padre y, e hijo, eh, uh, and all these people, of course, they don't want to be in the movie, the D, A, the C, I, no, of course, no one wants to be in the movie. That's why the Mexican government want to kill him. They didn't want to arrest him on 2016. They want to kill him. And now he was extradited, and now he's in the United States. The deal that El Chapo Guzman is doing with the United States government is, OK, I will keep silent. I will not do my movie, OK? You, I, will not, I will not do my movie. But I want my money safe, because everything is about the money, supposedly. The Department of Justice, United States, in New York, they said in the indictment that just El Chapo, just for him, solo sus ganancias, how you say, yeah? yeah uh, just his profits, he has supposedly 41 billions of dollars. So part of the deal is don't touch the money, I don't make my movie and I will keep quiet. Doesn't matter if he, maybe he will have to be all the, re the rest of, of his life in jail. I think that for him will not be able to escape from New York, from this jail in, in New York, but he will keep the most important thing. He works for this all his life, since he was six years old, this money. The money is the key of the business. I was talking many times, I have been talking many times with the lawyers or members of these cartels, and I met one lawyer that used to work for Ismael El Mayo Zambada, one of the heads of uh, the Sinaloa cartel. And he told me, you don't understand anything. You really, Annabel, you are stupid, you don't understand anything. You just see the death. The, the people murder. You just see the corruption, but you don't see the, the business of the, this business. It's not about murders. Yes, if the cartel have to kill to someone, they will. If they have to corrupt to the president, they will. But the heart of this business is the money. This is the most important thing. With the money, you can produce drugs. With the money, you can move these drugs. With the money, you can pay bribes. With the money, you can buy guns. With the money, you can buy bullets. You can buy women. You can buy houses. I mean, all is about the money. So why the international community? Doesn't, doesn't touch the money of the cartels because everything is about money, because this money really moves. I'm, 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 I don't know the number, but I, it's a number. It's, 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 it's a, in amount. It's, it's amount, uh, an, an amount about how many money the, this, this business produce for the world. Yeah, for example. Yeah. Billion. Yeah. 61 billion, yeah. So I think that the biggest issue about related with the, this uh, drug trafficking is the money. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman had the question about the 43 students. Yeah, well, um, uh, I supposedly be in last Sunday in one very important conference about this case. And I'm very really so sorry because I wasn't able to try it because my my flight was cancelled because this little, little snow here. So, <laughs> sorry, I, it was sorry snow! It was, was little. I, hear, I have heard that was little. So, uh, so um, I have been a journalist for the last uh, 24 years. I have, I, have, I have been doing a lot of research. I, invest, I dedicate five years of my life to investigate the case of the Sinaloa cartel, all their connections with the government and all these things. But I don't have any doubt that the most important case 
the most important investigation in my life is the case of the 43 students. Because I really, I really have learned many things in the last, in the last three years. Uh, these fathers, these um, mothers and fathers, um, very poor, the parents of these students, I think that have given a big les lesson, les lesson, lesson, yes, of dignity and love, not just in Mexico, in the world, because they are really fighting against one monster that became the Mexican government. And it's incredible for me that every September 20, every day, uh, every, every, every day, every, every, day, over every 26th day in every month, they, went, they go to protest to remember us that this case is impugned. Um, I was able to discover uh, by two years of investigation that the students really were um, attacked, who coordinate all the attack against the students, was the colonel of the 27th Battalion. I don't know if you remember the story, but uh, the, U the Mexican government, when this happened, the Mexican government said, uh, we, didn't, we, did, we didn't know anything about the attack. We were noticed about the attack two hours after the attack occurred. Was just the mayor, his crazy wife, this very little local police that did it. The army wasn't there, the federal police wasn't there. I mean, it was just a very local problem um, and a very local gang apparently involved in all these things. I went to Iguala, I traveled to Iguala on October of 2014, and I was able to, to investigate the case from zero because I really understand that many of the versions of the government were, were, were fake. For example, the government said, uh, start to arrest too many people that supposedly confessed, yes, 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 I killed him, yes, 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 was the mayor, yes, we did it, we, we warned them. But what I discovered is that the, more than the 80% of the people, and I'm talking about more than 100, 30 people that have been arrested in this case, more than the 80% were brutally tortured, brutally tortured. And they signed confessions of one crime that, that, uh, where they never participate. So uh, I was able to start to find a lot of documents that shows that was false, the version of the government, that through the C4, that is the um, uh, police uh, office in, in Iguala that were under control of the military that night. Uh, all, all the military, all the 27th Battalion, the federal police, also the PG, members of the PGR, uh, members of the state police, and some members of the municipal police were noticed about uh, the students even three hours before they arrived to Iguala. The federal government start to follow the students three hours before they arrived to Iguala. So this, what happened that night, was a plan, was not an accident, was something that was planified, at least by, by many hours uh, before the attack occurred. What I was able to, to, to discover uh, through the testimonies of the, of the witness, common people that were, were during the attack, because this attack occurred um, in the streets of this city, didn't, didn't occur in one, in one um, um, solitary place. It, this occurred in the middle of hundreds of, of, of witness. Uh, people start to tell me that not just people with uniforms of the police were shooting against the buses where the students were uh, transporting. They start to say that many of these people uh, that were shooting were people dressed as civilians. 
and I hear this version in the different points where the attack occurred. So when I start to, to request to the people, okay, how the civilians look in one point of the city, spontaneously, the people said, looks like a military. In another point of the city, they said, looks like a military. I said, it's not possible, because I asked many times to the survivors, to the students that survived that night, if they saw militaries there, uniforms, something, and they said, no, nothing. We just saw some policemen, and that's all. We couldn't see nothing, because was everything very dark. So after these first testimonies, I asked to the Mexican government, give me all the depositions, if they exist, made that made by the, the members of the 27th Battalion related with the case. I was the first journalist that asked for this because I really want to clarify what the people were saying. And what I discovered after a litigation, um, I have to use the one law that exists in Mexico that forced to the, the Mexican government to give to the citizens information, even if it is classified when it's related with human rights violations. So what I discovered is that the coronel, the head of the 27th Battalion, in his confession that the PGR tried to hide forever, he admit we were there. I sent to the different points where the attack occurred, military dressed as civilians. And when I got these documents, I really started to understand, okay, yes, the people, the, 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 the witness were not lying, were not drunk, I mean, they really saw militaries shooting against the students. So also, I was able to prove with documents that the, in, the, in two of the, of the scenes of, the, of this crime were bullets that belonged to the guns that the army was carrying on that night. I mean, I mean, it's not any dove, any dove, that at least 24 members, 24 members of the 27th Battalion participate directly in the shooting against the students, in the shooting. So um, uh, I was able to, to publish uh, this, this information. And I have to say that uh, I continue with, with my investigation. And I, and I think that um, I will be able to find them, because the students never were born were born it, as the as the Mexican government said. The Mexican government said uh, uh, that that night of September 26 of 2014, all the students, the 43 students, were uh, were killed, were murdered, and were uh, born <coughs> born it born yeah. it born it uh, in in one landfill next to Iguala. The truth is that this this never happened. I have uh, now a very important um, information that uh, says that um, the students were distributed in different groups. One group of the students uh, when were um, moved to inside, ins were moved inside the 27th Battalion. Uh, that's why the signal of one of the cell phones of the, one of the students that disappeared. The, the last signal that appeared came from the 27th Battalion. And um, other, other, other groups of the students were distributed in, in, different, in different parts near to Iguala. They were not born yet. Um, they, were, they were murdered in a brutal way. And I think maybe I will be able to to show where are the bodies. Thank you very much.
we are out of time, but I would like to really take one more question because um, there's, there were so, so many. Um, I think you up here have been quite, uh, quite patient, so <laughs> we'll do that. Um, um, yes. Thank you. Uh, you're injecting a very, for me, well-known Mexican uh, uh, attitude, which is distrust. I know that Mex my wife is Mexican. I've been in Mexico, living in Mexico on and off since 2001. Uh, I know that Mexicans don't trust each other. You are injecting that trust to a certain extent to us because we should not trust AHBC, we should not bank, trust Rabobank, which, and so forth. And I, I suppose that's your task as being a journalist. But at the same time, we need trust. So how, how do you know whom you can trust? How do you establish trust? And how can we move forward in that sense? Because the, you asked the question of the homework. What is our homework? And I still haven't got a straight answer to that because it requires a certain trust, if you ask yeah, me. I think that's a beautiful question to, to wrap up. And actually, why don't I'm going to end with you, Annabelle. But why, what is the homework? What, what is it that we all of us uh, can do. I'm going to start with you, Marijn, and then I'm going to work it over here because that's a beautiful wrap-up. Well, we, we can support Mexico by, uh, by buying the books um, fr and reading the articles of this uh, really brave reporters that still try to uh, uh, bring some light into this, this darkness, like, um, like um, Annabel said, and also pressure our own governments to, to, uh, and our members of parliament to uh, keep asking questions about it and to um, keep pressuring the Mexican authorities to, to respect the human rights, I think. All right, Jos? Yeah, I agree. Um, and there are some, some really great NGOs like Article 19 uh, that are working in Mexico that um, are basically supporting the freedom of speech. So you can, you can donate, for example, you can read these articles. Uh, I think also there needs to be some recognition about uh, how severe the use of drugs is. I wonder whether, whether people realize, people that, that use that sort of drug, know what is going on in, in, in the commodity chain and, and, and are aware of the fact that so many people die be because of the production of drugs. Uh, we have a lot of people in Amsterdam who are vegetarian, who buy uh, sustainable furniture, but I wonder <laughs> whether these people also um, abstain from using coke. <laughs> um, and uh, another point is indeed, know who you, vo who you are voting for. Um, in 2015, when I arrived back in the Netherlands, after Ruben Espinosa was killed, there was a, there was a press release as a consequence of Bert Koenders, uh, former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, visiting Mexico, press release saying like, Mexico and the Netherlands are more and more aligned, and so on and so forth. It was very applauding, and it ended basically with quote unquote, um, we really admire Mexico's efforts to undermine uh, international crime and, and drug trafficking. So, and uh, then you want him called to the Dutch parliament the next day and yeah. say, are you nuts? Do you have no idea what's actually going Absolutely. on there? Absolutely, yeah. All right, that's good homework. Annabel, what else can we do? Is there anything we could do? Please give us on a little December, bit of hope. On December 1st, I received the medal of the Legion of Honor from the French government. Um, I received this medal on 2014, since 2014, but I never claimed for it. I really think by many years that I didn't deserve it. But suddenly, I start to think in another way. Many people think that these kind of medals is just for extraordinary people, uh, really great artists, people with great talents, very smart, very good scientifics that could get the Nobel Prize. And of course, I'm not anything of that. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm, it's nothing special on me. I am not especially brave. I'm not uh, very smart. I have, to, I have to say that because it's true. It's true. And um, the ambassador uh, French gave a very nice speech uh, when he gave me this medal. But I really think, and this is for me the key for the life, 
who change the world every day is not the most uh, smarter people, is not the people that has power because they were elected as a president or as a congressman. It's not uh, the genius that uh, create new things. For me, the people that change the world every day is the ordinary people, common people, that have the courage to do brave and extraordinary things every day. And which are these brave and extraordinary things? First, for me, is be a human, not a robot of the system not a robot of Facebook, not a robot of Netflix, not a robot of anyone. Be independent. Be, believe that everyone has the power in, inside to change things, to, to speak openly, to do something for the people that is beside. Maybe yes, maybe we, can, we cannot fight against the cartels, maybe we cannot fight against the regime in Syria. But everyone, as a person, can do something for the other one, at least the people that is beside. So I think that is the ordinary people that decide to do everyday extraordinary things that change the things. I really, I really think that. And I think the hope in Mexico is this. And I learned this because I met these parents of the 43 students that there is very common, common people, ordinary people, very poor. They don't have anything, but they fight every day by, for the, the things that they believe. I have met the, mother, the mothers of some of the women that have been disappeared in Ciudad Juarez. They don't have nothing, but every day they, they search for the for the child every day they 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 they, they search for for the, the the people that they love and disappear so i think that um, this is the power that we have inside of us it's, this power is not outside this power belongs to us we have to do something with this Thank you very much. Thank you. I would disagree with you that you are not that you're just an ordinary person no, because you are incredibly brave and I think I have at least 100 people here in the audience who would probably agree that what you do is extraordinary and I hope that if in somehow in some way this evening contributed to you be able to give a voice to amplify the voice of uh, the people in Mexico who want a more just future then this will have been a successful evening and I think we wish you a lot of luck with your uh, with your amazing work and I invite all of you to stay and have a drink but uh, now, for now, thank you very much to Marijn and to Jos and to you, Annabel, uh, for this uh, very inspiring event.